Well, thank you very much. Is that sound good? Oh, excellent. I feel like I'm on television, so now I have to be careful. Um, and sometimes I speak a little bit loudly, so I'm trying to keep a very controlled voice, okay? Um, I thank you very much for coming today, and I thank uh, you for the invitation to come and speak with you today. I'm very happy to do it. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about myself. My name is Armando Perry, and you see there a picture of our team. I'm the big guy in the middle. Um, on one side to me, is Ms. Dawn Clements, who is my assistant ombudsman, and she works on the topic of special education. That is her primary focus, is to help parents understand um, about the topic of special education. And on the right side uh, is Ms. Carla Dallas, who is um, our uh, administrative assistant. So she is the first person that parents talk, speak with when they call on the phone or if they send an email. So I'd like to tell you a little bit about myself. Um, many, many years ago, in fact, about 54 years ago, I was a little boy living in what you call Jefferson Apartments. Back then, they were the Ravensworth Tower Apartments, and that's where I grew up as a little boy. And in, we had one apartment with my parents and myself. I'm the oldest. And then my grandmother had another apartment on the second, we were on the fourth floor, she was on the second floor, and my cousin and my aunt and uncle lived in another apartment. So like many of our families, my family emigrated to this area and came from the island of Cuba. And so this area has always been an area where immigrant families have come to um, provide for their families. So just like many of our families now, that's where my family started. So it's very good to be back home um, in this area of Bailey's Crossroads and Culmore area, so I'm very happy to be here. A little bit more about myself. Um, I started working as a school psychologist back before I had gray hair, and in that time I worked in elementary, middle, and high school and supporting students with testing for special education services, but also counseling services and helping families understand how they could help their children at home. To be, to be effective learners. Um, then I changed and became an assistant principal. I worked at Park Lawn Elementary, which is over near Lincolnia and Braddock Road. And then um, I worked at Irving Middle School. And then most recently, I was the principal of an elementary school, Pine Spring Elementary School, which is on Route 50 here in Falls Church, but closer to Fairfax Hospital. So I worked there as a principal for seven years. Um, this is my 24th year in Fairfax County Public Schools. So, uh, and I started here as a kindergartner back in, well, I won't say what year it was. It was a long time ago. Um, and then one more important piece of history about myself is that I'm also a parent of three daughters who attended school in Fairfax County, who graduated from school in Fairfax County. So I have been an employee, but I have also been a parent here in Fairfax County. So that's a little bit about myself. I'm going to go ahead, and by the way, I do have my presentation in English and in Arabic. The PowerPoint presentations are here on paper, so if anyone would like, you, you're welcome to it. We also have brochures, and I'll talk a little bit more, but I have them in uh, English, we have them in Arabic, Amharic, we have Chinese, we have Korean, Spanish, Vietnamese, and Urdu, and English. So that's eight. So we have all of those languages. So for you and your families, for your friends, for any neighbors that you might know, you may know a neighbor who speaks Vietnamese, feel free to take one of any language, take as many as you would like. Okay? All right. Um, I'll talk a little while, and then certainly I want to be able to answer questions. But if you want to stop me, if there's a very important issue, please feel free to stop me for any questions. Okay? So first, what is an ombudsman? When my father first heard that I was going to become the ombudsman, he said, you're going to drive an omnibus? Because in Spanish we say el omnibus. And I said, no, Dad, I'm not going to drive a bus. I'm, I'm an ombudsman. So he said, well, what is that? So I'm going to tell you what I told my father. Ombudsman comes from the Swedish, and it's a person who listens and who then helps parent or the community 
understand the government? Who is someone between the community and the government? Now, I'm going to ask a favor because that up there, I can't read it because it's Arabic. I need your help. If there are any mistakes, you have to tell me because then I'll write it down and then we'll make sure that our translators fix it. Okay? Now, then you can help me. <laughs> um, so the idea of an ombudsman is someone who helps the community understand the government office. And that's what we do. My job is to help parents, students, and the community understand how does Fairfax County Public Schools work? What are the rules? Who makes decisions? What happens if there's a decision that I don't agree with and I want some help trying to fix a problem? That is something that my office can help families with. Now, we have our rules of how do we work to support parents, and it's very important for parents to understand how we work. The first is that our office is confidential. When a parent calls us, the first thing we tell them is, first, thank you for calling us, but number two, anything that you share with me or with anyone in my office is confidential. Now, there are rules. If someone is in danger, we have to keep them safe. So if someone calls and says, someone is going to hurt someone, I, I can't keep that confidential. I have to keep them safe. Also, by law, I'm required to keep our children safe. Just like any teacher, any member of the school community, if there's a situation where there's a child, or a child is the victim of abuse or neglect, we must report it. So you might, you might have, I've had parents who've called and said, someone hit my child at the school. A teacher hit my child. I'm required to report it. I cannot keep that secret. And the, other, the third exception is um, if you as a parent give me permission. So if you say, Mr. Perry, please call and share my information with someone, then I will do it. But if you say, no, I don't want the principal to know that I've called or I don't want the teacher to know, I keep that confidential. And that is my commitment to every parent or any uh, student who calls us as well. Okay? Oh, I said the third. Those were the first two. If someone's in danger, if you give me permission. The third is if there's some financial fraud. Um, the state of Virginia says that if, if someone in a school is stealing the school money to put in their own pocket, I do have to report that. But other than that, if you're angry with someone or you're upset or frustrated, I don't call the principal, I don't call the teacher and say, oh, this parent called me. We don't do that. Our job is to be confidential and just to help you understand the schools. Okay? The second area is we are independent. What that means is that we can help parents with any topic. Parents will call us and we have helped parents understanding how to register their child for school, or maybe transportation, or the cafeteria, or maybe a problem that's happening in the classroom, or maybe with tests, grades. It can be any graduation. It can be elementary school, middle school, high school. Anything that a parent needs help that has to do with the school system, you can call my office and we can help you understand. We are impartial, which means we are neutral. I don't pick sides. I never tell a parent you're wrong or you're right. The parents come and say, this is what I want to achieve, and my job is to help you understand how do you work towards that. Before, when I was a principal, my job was to tell parents what I thought was right and wrong. So in that job, I did. I would say to a parent, but I knew the child. I had worked with the child for many years, and I could say, I think this would be the best for your son or daughter. But now, I don't know the children. If, if you call, I don't know the situation. So my job is to listen, to understand what you want for your child, and to help you know how do you work towards that goal. And then finally, I am informal, which means that I don't have any authority, I don't have any power, I can't change the rules, but I know the rules, and I can help you communicate with the people who do have the power, who do make the rules, so that you can express your wishes and that you can uh, be, you're the first teacher of the children as parents. And so we want you to work with us 
And, and the best way is if you know how the school system works. <coughs> Excuse me. So now I want to talk a little bit about what I call case management, which really means what should a parent expect it from working with my office? Well, first, I want to let you know how to call us or how to reach us. In the brochure, there's a phone number. There's also this, uh, a QR code, which is this. If you have a smartphone and you take a picture of that, it will take you to our website, which is another way that a parent can communicate with us. So they can call us, they can email us, and you see the email there, ombudsman at fcps.edu. But they can also communicate with us through the website. There's a button that says submit a question, and you can write a question there. But most parents call us on the telephone. Now, when they call us, sometimes they say, I don't speak very good English. I need help. And so our office will work, and we have translators available. Just yesterday, I, had a, I was talking to a parent. I was speaking English. The translator was speaking Urdu, and the parent was speaking Urdu. And we've done that with Arabic, with Spanish. Well, I speak Spanish, so that makes it a little bit easier. I don't need a translator. Um, Korean, any language that we have in Fairfax County, we can get a translator. So if you want a translator and you're afraid of speaking English, you can call and just ask for a translator in any language and we will arrange for that. And we'll call you back because sometimes it's very hard to travel to a meeting. And so parents say, well, I can't go. I don't have a car or I have to take care of my children or I have to work. And we say, it's okay. What time is the best time to call you? And if you tell me 12 o'clock in the afternoon is the best time, I call it 12 o'clock. Even sometimes, a parent says, I'm busy until 6 p.m. And I'll say, okay, we'll call you at 6 p.m. Not 10 p.m. By that time, I'm ready to go to sleep. That's a little bit too late. So a little bit earlier is better. Um, so this is what a parent can expect. When they call us, the very first thing that we do is we listen. We want to understand what is the situation that is that you, you need help with. Some parents want information. Who do I call? What, what are the rules? But sometimes parents call us because there's a problem and they want help solving a problem. They disagree with something maybe the principal is saying or perhaps the teacher or a decision that has been made and the parent wants to know, how do I fix this problem? And my job is to help you parents know how do you fix the problem? What are the right steps? So first, I listen, and then I ask questions because I want to be sure that I understand the situation. And then the most important question, what do you want to achieve? What's the outcome or the, 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 the res resolution, the solution that you want? Not what I want, not what the principal wants, what the teacher wants, what do you want? And that is what I help you understand. Not what I think is best, but I don't, because I don't know your child. I don't know what's important for your family. You know what's important for your child and for your family. So my role is to help you know how do you gain that, how do you work towards that goal. When you tell me what it is that you want, then I start thinking about what are the solutions. For example, a parent might call and say, my child, I live in this school neighborhood, but my child, the babysitter, is in that school. It's too far away for the babysitter. I need, how do I change schools? And my job is to help a parent explain how do you, what is the process for changing schools. There are strict rules about when you can and cannot change schools. My job is to help you understand them. It might be something else. Maybe a child made a choice and got in trouble at school. And maybe there's discipline. Maybe there was a fight in school or some type of misbehavior. And a parent says, I don't think this was fair. I don't think that the consequences for my child was fair. How do I tell the school that? What we call, how do we appeal the decision? Sometimes a parent will call because maybe their son or daughter was suspended for school for one day and the parent feels this is not fair. My job is to explain how do you talk with the principal about that, okay? So it can be about any topic. Um, and then, if you want my help, 
I ask for your permission. Would you like me to talk to the principal or would you like me to talk to the teacher? But only if you want me to do that. My real dream, my real goal is that you have the knowledge and that you feel the confidence to talk to the school directly. Because if today I help you solve one problem, tomorrow you don't need me. You can go and talk to the principal or to the teacher yourself. And that's what I think is the best way for parents. When, as when I was a father, I wanted to fix the problems for my children, not to have someone else fix it. So my job is to help, help you know how to do that. Okay. Finally, I want to talk a little bit about what we call casework. What that means is how do I support the parents? Um, for example, sometimes a parent will call and say, I want help with a problem and I explain some whatever options are available. All of the choices that a parent, like going to a restaurant and you choose what do you think is the best solution for your problem. And then we'll say, how about if we talk next week? Would you be okay if we talked on the phone next week and see did, was the problem resolved or do you still need help with something else? We call that follow-up. And so we'll try to follow up to make sure that the parent has all the questions answered. But parents can always call us as many times as they want to call us. Um, sometimes we will, the parent will say, please call the school and explain. And we will do that. And finally, sometimes parents ask, can you come to a meeting at the school with me so that you can help me explain to the school and help me understand the meeting? And we will do that. Not a lot, because as you saw in the first picture, there are only three of us in the office. So with 200 schools, it's hard for us to go everywhere. But if a parent wants us to go to a meeting, we can. Again, I can't tell the principal what to do. I can't tell you what to do. I don't tell the teacher what to do, but I help the parents understand the meeting. Okay. So how do we tell parents about our office, what we call outreach to our stakeholders? The first thing we do is we do meetings like this. We come out to the community. I have been to Bailey's Elementary. Was anyone here when I went to Bailey's Elementary School? No? Okay. So I went to Bailey's Elementary School, the primary building. And so if your school is another school like Glen Forest, oh wait, no, we went to Glen Forest. Did anybody go to Glen Forest? Maybe for that one? So one time I went to Glen Forest, I've been to Glen Forest and to Bailey's, both. But I can always go again. If maybe there weren't enough parents, if they invite me, I will always go and talk about our office. I love to come to other places. For example, here at, uh, your, at your mosque, to be able to come here and speak with you or to go to another church or a community, library, wherever it is, if parents are there, I am happy to go and explain what our office does. And so these are some of the organizations. In fact, I see there that SEPTA, the third one, that's an organization that's going to come, I believe, next week to speak with you. So I've been to their meetings as well. So we try to go to as many places as possible. I will say this. This coming Saturday at Fairfax High School, Fairfax County Public Schools will have a mental health and wellness conference. So if, if you or your family or your neighbors, if you, they, if you know anyone who's interested in learning more about wellness, taking care of our bodies and our minds, that's a great opportunity that's available. And I believe it's at like 8 o'clock in the morning or 9 o'clock in the morning until 1 p.m. And I believe lunch is provided. So that might be something to look for. It's a fun day. But it's a great day to come out and learn a little bit about how to be able to support our families. Because as we know, this time is very stressful. It's a stressful time with um, the, our, the community and sometimes people not agreeing, not getting along, problems with bullying, problems with um, fighting, and, and, and just the stress that all of our families face. That might be a great opportunity. So keep that in mind. Fairfax High School, next, this coming Saturday, October 5th, I think it is. 5th? Thank you. Again, if you know of an organization, your school or a, you're a, uh, if you have a homeowners association, your apartment building has maybe a community meeting, if you would like me to come and speak to the other members of your community, send us an email. I'm happy to come and speak with them. 
I mentioned brochures, so you see there the languages that we have, English, Amharic, Arabic, Chinese, Farsi, Korean, Spanish, Urdu, and Vietnamese. Please feel free to take as many of those as you like. If you take them, then I don't have to take them back to my office. It's a lot lighter for me, less work for me. And then we also talked with principals. We've talked with the parent liaisons at the school. It's very important for them to know so that they can help a parent. If you need help, this is someone that you, an office that you can call. So then I'd like to share with you towards two, two little slides at the end of what happens with all the, the calls that I get, all the information that I have. How does I try to help the families, but I also want to help Fairfax County Public Schools to be a better school for your children. So when issues arise, I do report to the chief equity officer, and he is in charge, Dr. Francisco Duran, and he is in charge of ensuring that our school system is available and serves all of our children. It doesn't matter what country you're from, what language you speak, um, what your needs are that all of our children are able to learn in our schools. So sometimes when I hear of things that are happening, I let him know but I never tell the name of the parent, the name of the child, or the name of the school. Because it's important to be confidential. I want people to be safe when they call my office. I also do have some reports that I write. Again, I never use anyone's name, any school name. The only things that I report, and I do report to the school board. Let me see. So I will tell them what, top, what are the topics, what, is this, what are the calls about. Or I will say, share with them um, how many people call my office about a certain issue, or perhaps what part of the county. We, you know, we, we have schools, but we also have regions. And so I will say, well, we have five regions. And I will say, well, there seems to be an issue in region, whatever the region number is, one, two, three, four, or five. And so if there is an issue that's, about, that's happening in one region, I will let them know. But I never tell the name of the family. I never tell the name of the student. I never tell the name of the school. Okay? So what type of calls did we receive this year? Um, in the, the last school year, 2018 to 2019, most of the parents who called my office wanted help understanding special education. That was, the most imp that was the most common topic. And so I think it's very timely that you're going to have SEPTA come next week to help parents understand. Um, it's important that as a parent, whenever we think that our child may need special education services or support, as, as parents, sometimes we worry. Will my child be able to learn? Will my child be able to speak? Will my child be able to walk? And so, this is, our children are the most important people to us. And so, we want the help. But sometimes, we don't understand the help that is offered. And so, my office is there to help. That if, if the school is talking to a mother or father saying, we think your child needs extra help at school, my job is to help a parent to understand what does that mean? What does the help look like? How, what is the process for getting help? And what happens with the paperwork? What, how, how does the school use that paperwork when they write down that my child maybe needs help with speech or with reading or math? And so my job is to help the parents understand that process as well. The second most common topic was about our school environment. Just as you had last week, Officer Ascarate come and talk about bullying and gang prevention. When parents called our office, they were concerned about bullying. They were concerned about discipline, um, excuse me, um, um, children who were not being treated fairly, maybe about how well the school communicates with the home. Always, want, you know, the parents want it to be a respectful communication, but also that we are working together to help our children. Sometimes parents call my office because they feel that the school is not listening or the school is not communicating. And my job is to help you as parents know what choices do you have. And sometimes I even call the principal or the teacher, if you give me permission, 
and I say, you know, the mother has sent an email and she hasn't heard back from the teacher. Can you help us get communication? And the principals will help us. Or maybe there's a misunderstanding. And the, a parent might call my office and say, they don't like my son or they don't like my daughter. And I help, to help, help them with questions so they can understand, is it that they, we don't like, that the school doesn't like the child? Or is there a disagreement of some type? And usually it's a disagreement. It's about how do we communicate well. So my job is to help that. The third topic is about behavior or discipline. And this is, as I mentioned before, if a student makes a decision at school and there's a consequence or a punishment like suspension, parents will call my office because they want to understand how do I protect my child? How do I make sure that this doesn't happen again? Or that if my child was a victim of, of somebody else's decision, how do I help them to be safe and to, and to be respected in school? And then you can see there are a lot of other topics from registering for school, um, transportation, the rules of Fairfax County Public Schools, even sometimes uh, issues of safety or discrimination. So we can help a parent with any topic. Okay. So that's the end of my presentation. Um, hopefully, I know I've been talking a long time, but I'd like to hear if you have any questions about how my office can help. I will ask for this, please. If you're thinking of a situation for your child, it might be better for us to talk on the phone so that we can be respectful of confidentiality. So I would ask, if you have a concern about your child or your school, <coughs> excuse me, please take my card and call my office so we can talk about it. But if you have a question about Fairfax County in general, like about the rules for transportation or food services, things, anything. I'm happy to talk about those today if I know the answer. Yes, please. So if I, let's make sure that I understand the question. What I, the question um, that she has offered is, in, in school, many times around winter time, there are a lot of activities that focus on the Christian holiday of Christmas, right? Counting Santa Claus or Christmas trees, and there might be celebrations. Um, and, and the concern that she shared is, why, how can we as a school system, or how can I as the ombudsman, help make some changes so that there isn't the focus on one, or preference, if you will, or a perceived preference for one religious group and then when sometimes schools will invite people to say, well, come and teach us about your religion if you would like, you know, should the responsibility be on the parent who's, who's a taxpayer um, on educating about multiple cultures or different cultures, different religions, and how can, and, and recognizing that some, some religious traditions fall at different times of the year, right? It's not always December, right? It, the, the, the calendar, for example, um, Eid or, or Rosh Hashanah. I mean, many of the religious uh, occurrences happen at different times of the year. Um, how can my office or how can Fairfax County Public Schools respond to those types of situations? Is that a pretty accurate summary? Um, I think... First of all, thank you for asking that question. It's a very important question because, in my opinion, it's very important that every child feel welcome in school. And if there's a big difference between seeing something in school and saying, oh, that's something that my friend believes or my friend celebrates. But sometimes it's, oh, that's something that doesn't belong to me. And we never want it to be anything that excludes another person. And so what I'm hearing is that your recommendation that, there should be, that schools should be more proactive in forming children about, if we're going to talk about one culture, talk about as many cultures as we can, right? And try to be as inclusive as possible. And I think that's, that's an area that every school system can improve. Um, and it's important for that question to be raised in a way of how, do, how are we inclusive of more communities. I will say this. It does often fall to members of the community, parents in the school, to help raise awareness. 
Because many people will say, oh, the tree is not a Christian, it's not a religious symbol, but it's connected to a religious holiday, right? And so it's important that while that may not be religious, it's connected to a religious holiday. And it's about education and helping people understand. But I think that my, my, one of the options that I see is having parents be involved in the PTA to help raise awareness and raise visibility of different cultures and offer opportunities. But I think that for many of us as parents, we are responsible to try to help improve our own school. I truly believe it's not the principal's school. It's not the teacher's school. It's our school. And we have to be part of the community and be part of the solution is my belief, right? Um, I will say this, that I know that in, in the school board office there was a recent request that we begin looking at our religious and cultural practices um, and looking at making recommendations for the calendar but also recommendations for, um, for instruction, for programs, um, for the rules of school, right? So about, for example, with dress um, or um, holidays, religious holiday, or time for prayer. And so there, we're looking at those rules to make sure that they are appropriate. I will also add this. We have an, just, I believe it was just last year, there was a new position in the school system to look at the instruction and to look at the cultural awareness in that instruction. We have a dedicated professional who works to look at what the children are learning in school and making sure that it considers other points of view. I probably will get this wrong, but I'll give you an example. In high school, when the children take world history, Traditionally, most of the world history has been based, the majority of what they learn is based in Europe. That's one part of the world. And less so on Asia, Africa, uh, South America, the other continents. And so what school is trying to do is look at that and say, maybe we need to change how much the children are learning and maybe increase the focus on other parts of the world so that we, if we're going to learn world history, we're really learning world history, not European history, right? Or not Western culture history. And so I know that's one. So it's an ongoing process, but I do thank you. I hope that helped a little bit. Well, I can certainly make the commitment to you today that I meet with the chief equity officer every week and I, can, I always let him know when I come to do community meetings, and I, I can assure you that I will absolutely raise that point with him in my next meeting with him. You're very welcome. I believe you had raised your hand, please. Right. Well, thank you very much for sharing the concern. In, instead of being able to talk about a specific situation, I think what I can do is talk a little bit about, in general, how my office might be able to help in a situation like this. For those of you who may not have been able to hear or for those who might be watching, um, the lady's question is um, about a situation with transportation where there were challenges with traffic and where the stop was, um, some issues perhaps with the driver and the authority or the manner in which the driver was responding to the children, but also um, the concerns over with so many children on a crowded, crowded bus things that might happen, safety issues or behavior issues um, that, might be, that might come up. Um, did I, did I understand? Uh, that's a good summary? Okay. So in a situation like this, if a parent calls my office, my goal is to help the parent know what their rights are and what options they have to fix problems like this. As the ombudsman, I don't change where the bus stop is, but there is a process and my job is to help you understand. Many times there are rules, who to call, I don't know who to call. Well, if I don't know who to call, how do I fix the problem? So my job is to help you find the right people and also to help you explain what is the concern that you have, but also to help you understand the rules that the school system has to follow. Like how do they decide where a good bus stop is? How do they decide how many children are allowed to ride on a bus? What, what authority does the bus driver have? 
And if someone is breaking the rules, then how do you as a parent advocate and speak to the right person to try to fix the problem, right? As you know, our teachers, our principals, our bus drivers, they are all human beings. We are all people. None of us are perfect. They do very good work. They do, they do this job not because they want to be rich, but because they want to serve children. But sometimes someone might make a decision or a choice that maybe we don't agree with or we don't feel is the right thing to do, the right way to talk to a child, the right way to keep them safe. And so it's important for you as a parent to know how can I help the school because you might be the first person who hears about a problem on the bus because the principal is in the school helping keeping the children safe. If there's a problem on the bus and the bus driver doesn't see it because they're driving, the children see it and maybe they don't tell a patrol, maybe they don't tell their teacher, maybe they wait and they come home and they tell you. And as parents, you, it's very important for you to communicate with the school about that and also to know, to be able to help the school know if there's a problem. When I was a principal, if a parent told me about it, remember, the rules of the school are the same as the rules on the bus. You're not allowed to hit people. You're not allowed to say bad words. You're not, you have to behave on the bus just like they do at the school. But it's a very difficult for a bus driver to drive the bus and to watch what's going on because we don't want them looking behind. We want them looking in front of the bus. Um, it's important for parents to know that most of our buses do have a camera, that a, a video camera that we that a principal can ask for the video to see if there was a fight. The principal can sometimes see what happens and who started it. And maybe your child said, I didn't hit anybody. And the video might show that, right? And so it's important to be able to see. But to your specific issues, the school can help the bus driver with how do, you, how do you take care of the children in a respectful way. When I was a principal, sometimes I would go on the bus and I would ride with, so that the children could see me and I could tell the children, the bus driver is just like a teacher. You have to respect the bus driver and the bus driver has to respect you. And sometimes when the principal is there, the children say, oh, this is very important. And that can help. So if a parent calls me about this issue, a specific issue, I will help them communicate with transportation, with the school, um, and to help them know what are the rules. Because if there are too many children on the bus, then transportation may have to put another bus to, to come if there are too many children. But here's where it gets tricky, and I will tell you from my experience as a principal. Sometimes there are 88 children on the bus that can take the bus, but not, not all 88 go, right? Because sometimes you might have the father or the mother may take the children to school in their car or something like that. And so when they count the seats, they only have 70 children on the bus because somebody was sick or somebody, you know, went with mom or dad to school. But if there are 88, what happens if all 88 show up one day? That's, that may be too many children. Maybe we need to ask for a second bus. But again, my goal is to help. I don't have all the answers. I can't change it. But what I can do is help the parent find the right person. Okay. Oh, thank you. Yes, please. So the question is, uh, what if in our school they don't provide a translator or an interpreter? Okay, for, and for any school. So I won't, you mentioned one high school, but it could be for any school. So Fairfax County Public Schools does have a translation services. Now, can you imagine, or can you guess, what language do you think they have the most translators for? Spanish. Why? Because we have so many people who speak Spanish. For Arabic, less, right? For Twi or Urdu, maybe less. I don't know all the numbers. So, but please know that when you request, you have the right to request a translator for a meeting, but I also need you to remember this, and this is what I would explain if someone calls me, this is what I will say. If you go now to school 
and asked to talk to the teacher right now, it might be very hard to get that translator. Sometimes you have to make an appointment so they can call and have a translator. But here are some options that I say to parents. First, the school can request that a translator come to sit in the meeting with you. But now with our technology, with our phones, we can actually have the translator be sitting in another school and speak on the telephone with you on speaker to help the teacher. But it has to be arranged, right? You have to schedule. If a parent says to me, but I call and I ask for a translator and no one is there, then I can help the parent call trans communicate with translation services but also please remember this I have a boss the teacher has a boss the principal has a boss right everybody has a boss and so if a teacher says no 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 we don't have a translator well then I think you have every right as a parent to say okay I wish to talk to the principal right and we have, and to always be able to talk to the supervisor, please know. We can always talk to the boss with respect, right? We talk, we say, I wanted a meeting with the teacher. The teacher says there's no translator. Can you help me to get a translator, Miss Principal or Mr. Principal? Yes, please. Right. So, if I understand correctly, and please help me to make sure that I'm correct, that in your experience, in three years, there's never been a translator in Arabic available, and that when you call and leave a message, if your daughter is sick and cannot go to school, sometimes you still get phone calls from the school saying that your daughter is absent, even though you've already called. Is that correct? Of course. So, so, so sometimes children, like if, if a parent is sick and a child is home helping them or with a little brother or little sister, and then there's a, there's a, they're absent from school and they get a phone call. I, and I'm happy to do that. So to try to be general, if, if a parent ever feels that school is saying, no, 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 we don't have a translator, you can call my office and we can help to try to make sure that there's a translator. Not for an emergency, well, sometimes for an emergency, sometimes. I will say this, that Fairfax County Public Schools does have the phone lines where you can leave a message in Arabic, Urdu, any language, Amharic, whatever it is, you can leave the language, the message, and someone will call you back. They will hear the message, they will translate it, they will get the information, and they will call you. Sometimes it takes a little bit of time, but it is on the Fairfax County Public School website. And I can share that perhaps with you, Stacy, if you want to make sure that parents have access to that, um, to make sure that you can see, because there's, you can call any language and they will get a translator to, cha to translate the message that you leave. Yeah. And, and I think that's, and you, and you have a parent, as a right, you have, to, uh, the right to, you have the right to ask anyone to help you to try to translate. Um, we were talk I was talking with one of the ladies before about um, how hard it is when you speak a language, not English, and when you want to communicate with school. One, one suggestion that I have given to some parents is, you know, with this technology, you can even have your child record a message in English and speak it to someone. So, for example, if they say, maybe the recording says, um, my mother does not speak English, she wants to talk to the principal. And you can even record your child and when you call the school and say, you can say, no English, play, and, and it gives the message. So a lot, we have to be very creative of all the different ways that we communicate. I know that this, we want to try to communicate well, but as you pointed out very accurately, sometimes it takes one or two days to translate, get the information, and then have someone call you back. Yeah, it's, it's very frustrating. Please. My understanding is that it's a recording where you leave the request for information. It's not a live translation service. I'm not familiar with that, but I can certainly add that to the, the questions that I have 
um, so that they can look at, as I said, in my office, I don't have the authority to do that, but I can always pass the message along. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Yes, please. Yeah. Excellent question. So the question is, how do we address when a parent calls my office to, with a complaint that there was bullying and that the school did not address them, that they didn't do anything about it? Um, so the very first thing I do is I listen and I understand the situation so that the parent can, can explain what happened to their child and what the school did or did not do. And then it depends on where the problem is. For example, if you tell the teacher, but the teacher did not tell the principal, then maybe the, the solution is to make sure the principal knows. But maybe the principal knows, but you don't like the decision the principal made. Remember I said before, everyone has a boss, right? So you can talk with the principal and you can say, I don't agree with what you did. We have to fix this. And maybe the principal will help you fix it. But if they don't help you fix it, then you have the right as a parent to talk to the principal's boss. That's the region office, right? And there are rules about the documentation of bullying that the, the, the state and the school system have rules of what has to happen if there's bullying, where the school has to decide, did bullying really happen or was this... I'll, I'll give you an example from when I was a principal. In kindergarten, two children are playing. They both want the ball. One child pushes the other child and takes the ball and then goes and plays. Well, I think most of us would say, well, that's not bullying. Pushing is wrong, but that's not really bullying. Bullying is when the same child goes to the same child all the time and pushes them every day and takes the ball from them every day. That might be bullying. But one time that it happens, maybe it's not bullying. I think of my daughters. Sometimes my daughters were not angels, right? Sometimes they maybe push their sister. That's not bullying, but if you push every day, now it's bullying, right? It may be bullying. The school has to talk to the children, talk to the teacher, and understand and then make a decision. Yes, this was bullying or no. But then they also have to give you a plan. How do we protect your child? How do we make sure that your child is safe in the classroom, on the playground, in the bathroom, in the hallway, on the bus, right? And so the school is required to talk to you. If the school doesn't, then I can help you ask the school for that information. And if you don't get it, you can always talk to the bosses, right? To go up to the boss. Does that answer your question? Thank you. Yes, please. So to repeat the question for those who might be watching on the video, um, the lady is sharing the concern about, you know, many times students are thinking more about what clothing they're wearing, what shoes they wear, the fashion, um, and that your experience in other schools has been that when they use uniforms, that this is a better situation for children because they're not always thinking about what they're wearing and, and not so much telling the parents what they want, but they're more focused on schoolwork. Um, I, I think that if a parent group wishes to change, so Fairfax County does have rules, some rules about dress code, but it's more about it being appropriate and that it covers appropriately, that it's appropriate for school, and that whatever it says doesn't say anything that's offensive, right? But the rule, but if, but if I want to wear jeans that cost $150, I can, right? If the, 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 that's what you're referring to. Um, when parents want to make changes, um, especially when it comes to policies, things about the rules of the school system, um, that is something that, that is a process that parents can engage with the school leadership but also the school board because they are the ones who make the rules. They approve the rules. So the county school, the superintendent makes recommendations of rules and then the school board approves or declines that. So for that to happen, there would have to be a significant number of parents and community members who believe this is, the most, this is a very important thing to do. Um, 
And I'm not going to say whether it's a good idea or a bad idea. Some, when I was a boy, one of the schools I went to, no uniforms. The other school, one school I went to, had uniforms. So I have my own opinion, but that's not my job, is to say if that's a good idea or a bad idea. But to help you know, to make that happen, you need a large group of parents who believe this is important. I'll give you an example. How many of you remember when they changed the time for high school? You remember? That happened. The chain, high school was very early. 7.20 in the mornings, high school began. And there was a large group of parents who said, this is not appropriate. They must sleep more. So that group of parents worked with the school board to make a change in the policy that now high school starts at 8.20. I think, I don't know what time justice starts. 8.10. So they moved it a little. But that happens because there's a large group of parents who believe that this is important. And for something like uniforms, that's what would have to happen. Um, I, I suppose that a... I, I don't know that a principal could just make that decision for their school because, let's say, uh, what are the colors for Justice High School? Do you, and does anybody know the colors of the school? Is it like, no? Nope. Right, but I, well, let's, I'll make the color. Let's say it's blue and red. Is that, okay. Oh, I guessed I was lucky. So if it's blue and red, well, imagine the principal says, when you come to school, you must wear a blue shirt, this blue shirt, and these pants. Maybe red pants, I don't know. That would look silly, but maybe red pants and blue shirt. Well, now we're telling a parent what they have to buy for their child. And do we say any blue shirt? Or is it this blue shirt that costs $20? And there's Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, right? And so sometimes it's how, do we, how does the school tell a parent what they have to spend their, how they have to spend their money? So it can, it's a little tricky, um, but you're buying clothes for your children anyway, right? But anyway, th those are the little things that make it hard for like one principal to say, in our school, we're going to have this uniform. And then there are some schools, even some public schools in other places that will say white, white shirt with uh, blue pants or khaki pants, right? The, like tan pants. But for that to happen... Um, there needs to be a lot of support for that. Right. Yes, please. Right. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make it a little bit more general um, because I, I certainly, we would have, to, if you want to call my office, we can always talk in more detail for your particular children. But I will say this. Um, the school system ha does have assessments or tests that they give um, when children are new to our schools, or every year, if this is a child who does speak another language, who, is, who has ESL services, or ESOL services, um, there's a test every year to see how much progress they have made in their English. It's English, it's speaking it, reading it, and writing it. So we measure all of that. Now, it's important for you as parents to know that you, it's a, you have a right to understand that test and wh how is your child progressing. You also have the right as a parent to talk about what's the best type of education for your child. Now, in elementary school, it's a little different because we don't have ESOL classes like where the child spends all day. And they maybe they maybe when they're just learning English, maybe they come out a little bit of time to learn some English, but then they usually stay in their regular class. In middle school and high school, as you may know, sometimes when a child doesn't speak a lot of English and doesn't read and write a lot of English, they might be in an ESOL English class where there's a teacher trying to help them learn English. But as a parent, you can go to school and you can tell them if you agree or disagree with that class. Right? And if you're absolutely right. A lot of parents don't know about that, and that's one of the reasons that I'm here, and that I think your role as parents is to say to them, if you have a question, if you don't think it's right, 
call the ombudsman. Maybe the ombudsman can help you understand and figure out and learn how to fix the problem, right? Because you're absolutely right. Some parents don't know. They just think it, whatever the school says. Yeah. It's very, it's very important for parents to know that you have a voice in making sure your child is getting the right classes. For, think of math. Some children are very good at mathematics. And so you as a parent can say, I think my child can take an honors class. And you can say, I think my child is ready for a harder class. I want to, but maybe there's another subject where it's much more difficult for them. You know your child very well. You have a voice. You can work with the school to make sure your child is in the right classes. Okay. Well, and that's about ed helping them get the information and educating them. You're absolutely right. And I've written down... He I think we can always improve the way we're re giving parents information. Maybe when they register to say there's some, to have someone maybe speak. There are lots of ideas. Some schools do it very well. And I think if we can learn from those schools, how do you communicate with parents and share ideas for other schools? That can sometimes be very successful. Thank you very much. Yes, please. So the concern, if I understand correctly, is what decision is, how is the decision made if there's no data, if it's just on the child's... Okay, so why, why are they labeling children who don't need the service? Mm -hmm. right. So the question is, is that happening because, just because of their name, right? Yeah. So I, I can certainly ask that, send that question up to ESOL to, at, at the Willow Oaks office to ask them. I believe my understanding is that the first thing that people look at is the home language survey. Oh, it's my, my pleasure. Thank you very much. Thank you. It's been a, a very, I'm very happy to have been here. I hope you'll take my uh, brochure cards because I think each of these situations can be very different, and that's why it's so important to talk with each parent about their situation. And, and I spend a lot of time talking to parents about their specific situation. So I hope that you'll call uh, if you need some assistance or tell your friends to call. But thank you very much.